where do we find the truth? In the Word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Um, and it's a new message series. You know what that means? We get to learn a new verse together. And the, and the verse that we're learning together during this, this series is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And again, on your way out uh, this week, um, we will be handing out the, the uh, copy of the, the, prayer, or the, the memory card uh, that you can grab. Uh, if, if this is your first time getting a card, uh, we also have a box that you can put it in. We hope that you put it on the mirror or whatever. Uh, but then keep all the scripture that we've memorized throughout the year uh, in a box. And if you need one, again, by the prayer wall, there's a, some box, plastic boxes back there. If Feel free to grab one. Um, but this is the, the verse that we're going to be learning uh, through this series. Uh, we usually say it twice on a Sunday morning. So if you will join me, starting with the reference uh, and ending with the reference, uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. Are you ready? 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. 2 Timothy 2.2. All right, and now we move on to our second time, which apparently is the charm today, right? 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The series is investing in others, so it kind of makes sense that this is the direction that we're going. Take a look at this video. Cars travel pretty fast on Bear Valley Road in Hesperia. The speed limit here is 40 miles per hour, right in front of this car wash where Monday afternoon... Gusty high desert winds rolled a stroller with a baby inside of it right out toward the road. That's the little one's great aunt struggling to get back on her feet after falling as the nightmare plays out. She sees nobody. She sees the child going into the street and that's all she sees. She can't do nothing. Ron Nesman was waiting on a bench outside the car wash when he saw the woman in her 60s go down hard on the asphalt while trying to catch the stroller. Didn't have time to even think about it. I just, you just react. Here he is on camera running over with the intercept, saving the baby boy before he made it all the way down the driveway and into the passing cars. And I said, you know, I, I got it, you know what I mean? Because I seen it, I felt so bad for the lady. It was like, uh, I couldn't imagine. I got nephews and nieces, I couldn't imagine something like that. But Ron says he can imagine being in that kind of distress because he's felt it before. My girlfriend passed away in 2018 and uh, so yeah, it was sudden, so I didn't want to do anything. The former truck driver says he became homeless after that heartbreak and only recently moved to Hesperia to reconnect with his family. He had just wrapped up a job interview when he unknowingly stepped into a new role as this little boy's hero. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I did nothing, of course, you know. I'm just glad I realized it and was on it, you know. Isn't that quite the story? If I remember correctly, this happened just this past year. Um, and, and, and I see something like this, and it, and it just makes me, my heart break, of course, uh, for, for the lady, right? Um, because you're falling, you can't get up, and, uh, and the child is just moving to da towards danger. So thankful that this guy was able to step in at the last minute and, and kind of rescue her. But, but as I was thinking about it this week, it, it, it just made me uh, ask a question, and I'm not trying to, to, to get down on, on anybody, but the question is, is what's something that you've learned in a hard way? And, and I was thinking of this lady, and, and I wonder what lessons she learned uh, in this situation. You know, it, it, we often, uh, you know, when we had kids, we'd stroller them around, and we never, ever thought of putting the brakes on. We just didn't. And yet in this moment, it would have made all the difference in the world, wouldn't it have? And so I'm guessing that maybe is a lesson that, that she learned in all of this, right? Um, you know, I, there, there could be other ones, right? Um, <laughs> wear the type of clothing that you won't have to have blurred out when you're on a camera sometime. I, I don't know. I was, uh, uh, Car and I were coming back from Colorado this past week, and, and we stopped, and it was a crazy windy day, and I'm out there trying to, to wipe all the bugs off the windshield, and my shirt comes flying up over my shoulders. That's not something I want people to see, right? And you're all think, saying, and we don't want to see it either, Justin. Uh, thank you very much. And, and so, of course, that's one of the things that comes in my head. But, but also this gentleman who's just recovering from, from being homeless. And what do you think he learned in this situation? That maybe I should keep my eyes peeled so that I maybe might be able to impact or help the lives of others. 
And that could be something. Uh, what's something you've learned the hard way? Uh, I, was, I was thinking, so, so what would be a lesson that I could share with all of us um, just because we learn from it and hopefully we can pass some information along to you. Now, this happened years ago, but, but our second oldest child, Asher, uh, he was at a camp and, and you know, I dropped him off and, and got home and, and we get a phone call um, after I get home and, um, and it's the nurse from camp. And, and she said, hey, uh, don't want to alarm you. Um, but uh, but your son Asher fell um, and he hurt his arm and uh, it seems to be okay um, you know and we gave him some aspirin and it's like well how's he feeling you know well is, everything seems to be fine and, and so we thought nothing of it all right we we didn't even it was my fault right it, we, I didn't even ask more questions to find out what happened all right and so I drop him off on Monday I go back to the camp on Thursday because I'm leading communion and the, the closing service at this thing and, and I get there right before dinner time and I show up at, or at dinner time and Asher is sitting at a table um, eating with his left hand and his right arm is just hanging there like this okay and, and and so I go and I sit down with him and I say hey Asher how's it going oh it's fine can I take a look at your arm and his arm literally bent down and back up uh, okay uh, and so so it was like oh my goodness and I said S -s -s does it hurt he goes yeah it hurts a lot <laughs> all right um, uh, you know but but in, in the midst of this I'm thinking his arm's broken uh, and pretty bad, uh, and it wasn't caught, um, and, and so you might be able to blame uh, the, the, the nurse's fault or the camp's fault, but I also got the call, and I said, keep him there. Go ahead. Everything's going to be fine. Just keep him there. So it was also my fault, right? And, and, and so I quick call Cara. We set up a doctor's appointment, and the very next day, because Asher wanted to stay for the end of camp, very next day we left, and we basically headed right to the doctor's office uh, to, to, uh, to get, get him in. And of course, it was broken. You know, uh, both bones were broken, um, you know, one of them twice, and the, you know, the other one once. Uh, so it was just this terrible, terrible break. And so, of course, he gets it casted, uh, and everything seems to be fine. He's wandering around with a cast, right? Everyone gets to write on and all that kind of stuff. Except that what we find out, that our insurance company refused to pay uh, for the recovery of the injury. And we fought it for months. Uh, but they had a thing that said, if an injury happens and you don't uh, have it checked within 72 hours, we are not liable to take care of it. And we didn't. And so we ended up, after fighting and, fa and losing, um, spending, you know, <laughs> thousands of dollars in order to help this kid <laughs> just get his weird-looking arm uh, back the way it is. And so I'm just passing that information along to you. A uh, couple things you might be able to take from this, right? You know, number one is, is if somebody calls and says, hey, <laughs> you may want to listen a little more. I assume everything's fine. Make sure you ask a bunch of questions um, as, as, as you move forward. And the second thing is, if, if an injury takes place, I would get the person to the hospital and get it checked as soon as possible, especially if you have insurance, right? Um, and so just a couple of pieces of things um, for you to be thinking about uh, as, as we start talking about about uh, the idea of investing in others. That's what this whole message series is about. We're going to spend six weeks looking at a person and how they invested in another person and, and how um, God's word ends up being passed along and these lives are changed and they're impacted so that they can more and better and more, you know, in, in efficient ways or whatever become all that God wants them to be. That's what this whole series is about. And, and I'd love to start by saying we all have choices, right? And, and here's one of the choices that I think we all have. We all have the choice um, to experience things in this world. And as we experience these things, some of these things can be difficult, right? Some of these things can be frustrating, and some of these things can be time-consuming. But we also have the choice to see other people go through difficult experiences, <laughs> And here's the thing that I've learned, and I'm just trying to give us a little bit of a hint of, 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 of something that we can do in life as we move forward. If somebody else goes through something and you don't have to, that might mean that your life, at least when it comes to this, can be less difficult, less frustrating, and less time-consuming, which is kind of this silly way to say a wise person might be able to tell you to let other people go through the difficult things in life and take the time to learn from them. Because if we don't, and we go through something, then we're going to have to experience those difficulties the same way or worse than that person did in their lives. And why would we want to do that? As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why I, I think reading is so incredibly important, because most nonfiction books, and even some fiction books that are, that are written, 
Um, the, the focus is, is somebody, somebody who's talking about an experience that they had in their life, and they're just trying to pass along some information to other people, whether that's historical or, or whether that's in, in the area of, like, like, you know, I just recently uh, listened to a book on prayer. And, and, and the whole idea behind that book is you get to see this person's life and their commitment to prayer and how that impacted their life, and now I have a choice to make. What am I going to do about this information that I learned? I, I actually think uh, in, in, in this world, especially the followers of Jesus, the Christians, that, that there are three types of people that we need to have in our lives, okay? There are these three people, and I think we need to have them in our lives. And the first one is just simply a friend, right? So, so what is a friend? I, I, I define a friend as those who walk alongside us, right, uh, that we can mutually encourage and support, and hopefully uh, we have those type of people in our lives where it's kind of like your buddy, your friend, and, and, and the, you know, they're always there for you, that type of stuff. And we, you know, I think that is so important for us to have in our lives, each and every person. But I also think there's two other types of people that we need to have in our lives. And, and what I'm going to use today is, is the word mentor because the investor in others did not fit on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to use the word mentor. Um, and, and so what's a Mentor. A uh, mentor is those that we learn from uh, as they share wisdom and life experiences. People who have gone through things, and you know what? We could probably learn from their experiences. And, and as we meet with these people, people who are intentionally investing in the lives of others, they challenge us to reach and fulfill our potential. I think that's so important that each and every one of us has somebody in a sense that we can look up to and ask some questions. And, and try to figure what it means to live for Jesus in this area, or what was it like when you went through this, and hopefully we can learn from these things. And then I also think that there's a third type of person, and that is somebody that we are investing in, or a mentee. As it says, someone whom we can share our experiences. And, and, and you might think, well, I've got nothing to share. I would question that, because we've all gone through things. I mean, this is uh, a key part of this is parenting or grandparenting, if you want to say that, right? Where we're seeking to offer and instill the best in our children and our grandchildren. Everyone can profit from the wisdom and experience of others. Friends, that's what this whole series is about as we look to invest in others. The passage of Scripture that, that we're heading into today, uh, what we have happening is, is if, if we look back to the beginning of Exodus, uh, you know, God calls Moses uh, to free, help him to free the people uh, who are in slavery in Egypt. And Moses does that. They've walked through the Red Sea, and now they're wandering through the wilderness. They have not received God's law yet. Okay? So you have these people that, that for generations and generations have just been slaves. They don't know how to live. They don't know the law the expectations, how do we live with one another? And now we're, we've been invited into this relationship with the Almighty God who says, uh, I want you to be my children and I will be your heavenly father. And let's be in community together. And now they're trying to figure out, well, so what does it mean to live in community together? And, and there's a lot of people that are here. And, and of course, when you get people together, even like us now, right? Uh, there are people that are going to see things differently. And, and people will get into some times where there's some disagreements. And how do you deal with that disagreement? Well, what, what the Israelites were doing at this time is, is when the disagreement, they weren't able to work it out, they would go to Moses, their leader, and say, hey, we're having this issue. Would you help us to figure out what, how God wants us to work through this? And that's where we are as we pick up the scripture today. And so, Lord, as we begin to look at uh, your call, I believe, God, for us to be people who are invested in, which I hope today is about for us, but, God, that we are also investing in others. And that is scary sometimes, Lord. It feels like a challenge. God, often I don't feel like I, I am even worthy to do that. But I think your word shares with us that you want us to. And so may we, as, as we begin to think through, uh, allow uh, the scriptures that we are going to be hearing about this impress into our hearts your calling on our lives. And that we would be the people that say yes to you and to what you're calling us to do and to be. And God, as we hear about investing in others. May the words that I share, the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you. For you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen.
Okay, so so now we know that the, the, all these people disagreements they are coming to Moses. Okay, so so that's that's what happened, and then and then we get to verse nine, which Alex read for us today. It says Jethro was delighted to hear all about the good things the Lord has done for Israel and rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. So I just want to stop and say, who's Jethro? All right, who is Jethro? Well, Jethro is actually Moses' father-in-law. So, so let's, let's go back and start looking at, at a picture of what happened. So Moses was, was born, uh, you know, and, and at a time where the, where the firstborn, uh, the male children, you know, they, they were being killed, uh, the, the Hebrew kids were being killed, and, and, and Moses' mom hides him, puts him in, this, puts him in, the, in, the, in a basket in the water, right? Uh, and, and the Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and, and, and finds him and says, yeah, I, I, I'm going to take care of this kid. And, and so she does. The, the word Moses means draw drawn out, okay, drawn out, which I think actually Im- implies some pictures uh, of what investing in and investing in others could mean, it's the idea of drawing out from one uh, so that others can learn from the experience and the wisdom that one has. Okay, so, so Moses is hanging out in Egypt for 40 years, right, and then there's one point where he sees a, a, an, an Egyptian treating one of the Hebrew slaves poorly, and he kills the Egyptian, thinking that he's helping the Hebrew guy, okay, so, so, uh, so that happens, and then the, like, like the next day, a couple of Hebrews are arguing. And Moses, he tries to step in to try and help them to figure this out. And one of the Hebrew people says, what, uh, if, if you don't like what we're doing, are you going to kill one of us as well? So they had already heard about it. And, and so now uh, Moses is nervous. He ends up fleeing Egypt and heads out to the middle of nowhere, this land called Midian, this area called Midian. Okay, And so now he is there, and he ends up meeting this guy named Jethro. You want to know what the name Jethro means? Friend of God. Remember that as we move forward with this. Okay, so he meets this guy named Jethro, and Jethro gives him a job. And so now Moses is tending Jethro's flock. And while he's tending Jethro's flock, he also sees that he has a daughter that he finds quite interesting. Okay, so Moses ends up marrying one of Jethro's daughters. Her name is Zipporah. Okay, I I don't know why that name hasn't continued on, and people are naming their kids Zippy these days. I don't know why, but it's one of those names that kind of just gets lost in in, in the Bible, right? And so, so Moses is now married, and so for 40 years, he is tending to the flock and, 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 and being a dad and a husband to some children that they start having. All right, so we have the picture of what's going on. All right, so now he's around 80 years old, and, and, and God speaks to him in the burning bush and, and says, I want you to be the one who, who helps me to release the people from slavery in Egypt. After, after some uh, discussion about it, Moses reluctantly agrees, and he says, okay, God, I will do what you want to do. So Moses, the scripture tells us, and Zipporah and the kids, they all head back to Egypt. All right, uh, to, to make this happen. Now, from that point, we don't know, but there was some point where, where the wife and kids ended up being sent back to Jethro. Now, we don't, Scripture doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us why, um, but, but he ends up having the kids while Moses continues to do the let my people go thing, okay? So he finally gets the people uh, let go, and so, so they've crossed the Red Sea, and now they're wandering through the wilderness, and, and they're trying to figure out what it means to be God's children when Jethro shows up with the wife and kids in tow, <laughs> to bring them back to Moses. Okay, so that's where we are. And, and Jethro says, was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done. And hold on to that, the good things that the Lord has done. I mean, that is a, a really, even right there, a powerful statement. And we will get to it again here in a little bit. But all the good things the Lord had done for Israel re- in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. And so Jethro's hearing the stories of all the powerful things that God did. And he, and he said, praise be to the Lord. Praise be to the Yahweh. Uh, praise be to the covenantal God who invites us to be in relationship with him. That's the Lord that this is talking about, right? Praise be to this one who, who rescued you from the hand of Egyptians and of the Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians, right? Moses, you have been rescued, and everyone has been rescued. And that is worthy of giving praise and glory to God. He is speaking it out. He is seeing that God truly has done something extraordinary. And this is a big deal because he lives in a land uh, and they are wandering through this, this area where there are tons of other nations um, who, who worship other gods, and Jethro's beginning to realize that, that the one true God, Yahweh, is it. He is the one. And he's saying, he's the one who rescued you, Moses, and all of these people. And he says, now I know. I have come to the realization because what I've seen in your life and the things that God has done in and amongst you, I now know that the Lord, God, is greater than all other gods, right? For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. 
right? They thought they were better than Israel. God said, after a while, he said, nope, and so I'm going to free them. And now I realize that God is the one true God. And, and as, as we start thinking about what it looks like to invest in the lives of others or to be invested in, one of the things that I begin to notice here is, is that Jethro acknowledges where he sees God at work. And what a powerful, powerful principle for us to be thinking about. It's actually one of the blanks to write down in your notes if you're following along in the bulletin. It is, is he is beginning to see what God has done. And he says that is worthy of praise. I mean, there's a handful of other, uh, there's a handful of other uh, principles that I think we can get in, look into this, right? Uh, one of them is, is that you and I have things uh, that, that, in, that we see that maybe we should be sharing with others, right? Uh, it, also that, that, that there are people in our family that could probably hear from us things that might be helpful for them as they go through something. I mean, there's a variety and a handful of things, but the most noted one is he sees where the hand of God is at work and he acknowledges it to Moses and to everybody. My, my mentor, Tim, uh, he, he's somebody who trains people to become coaches, uh, certified coaches. And, and, and I love that in his training, the first thing that he encourages people to do when they sit down with somebody else, just to talk through whatever they're going to be talking through, he says, always remember these three words. He says, listen, care, and celebrate. Listen, care, and celebrate. As you sit down with somebody, find out the things that have, that have gone amazing in the past week or two or since the last time you met and tie it to what God has done in their lives. Listen to them, love them, and celebrate what God is doing. And that's what Jethro does with Moses at, at the beginning of this. All right, so, so then he continues on. It says, when his father-in-law saw all, all that Moses was doing for the people, so, so he's looking around and he sees that Moses is, is, is there and people keep coming to him, right? So he said, so, so what is this that you're doing to the people? I mean, this is, this is just a kind of a, a, tr a true question, right? So, so what's going on here? I haven't been following you, but I see all these people uh, coming to you. So, and, and why is it that you sit alone as judge? while all these people are standing around you from morning till evening. And so, so what does this picture look like? Well, I, I, I kind of honed in on the, all these people. And so how many people are there? Well, if you were to look just a couple chapters earlier, it says the Israelites, they've journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, right? And there were about 600,000 men on foot besides the women and children. So how many people are there? Well, uh, you know, you would, the, the men that are counted, pr most of them probably have lives, so you're at 1.2, and you haven't even talked about the children, right? Which, if you, if you have 2.5 kids, maybe they did back then. Actually, they had more kids back then. But, but we're in the millions of people, okay? So you have the idea of, of what was going on, and millions of people are following Moses. And it says, and many other people, they, they, they start following this, hearing about this one true God, and they start joining in the camp as well, and they start following. And so they've got these large droves of people and livestock, both flocks and herds, and they are all gathering around Moses, maybe not everyone at the same time, but gathering around Moses to get some answers. Is, is this the type of format that, that is going to work in the long run? Probably not, right? But, but this is what Moses was doing. He gets caught up in this thing, and he's the one who, who seems to be the, the, the spokesperson of God. He's the one who goes and meets with God and comes back and shares what he says. And so it kind of makes sense how he ends up in this situation. And sometimes we end up in situations that we certainly don't mean to, and we might need some people from the outside to come in and just take a look at what's going on just to see how things are going. That's why every once in a while we do secret shoppers that come into church just so we can get their perspective on the things that they see to help us to, to better uh, offer what, you know, to better offer the things that God is calling us to share. All right, so, so Jethro's kind of that, that secret shopper guy, except he's not a secret. And he's coming, he says, why are you doing this? Why are you sitting alone? All these people are standing around, and they're waiting for you, the one person to answer all their questions. And Moses answered him, here's why I do it. It's because the people come to me. The people come to me to seek God's will. If somebody comes to you to seek God's will, what are you going to do? Well, hopefully you will do your best to help them to seek God's will. And that's exactly what Moses was doing. They're coming to me, so I'm going to help them. 
Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide uh, between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions, that, that, I, that I begin to hear from God the things that he wants us and how to, to live as a community of his children, and as he shares those things with me, I pass them along. Brilliant, wonderful job that God's given Moses to do. But Moses' father-in-law replies, what you're doing is not good. What you're doing is not good. Now, is, is, is the work that Moses is doing bad? Absolutely not. But, but what, what the father-in-law is, is trying to help him to understand that your approach to doing it may not be the best for the people around you. It can't be done by just one person. It is not good. It, it actually, it, it's, it's in contrast to verse 9 where Jethro was saying, all the stuff that God is doing here, all of that is good. Man, what God is doing is good. But now it's in the hands of humans. And sometimes the things that we do aren't good. And I think we all understand that. Sometimes the things that we do aren't good. Even as we're trying to, to show God things, they, they just aren't good. Uh, the, the language of aren't good or is not good, it actually is the same type of language that's used in Genesis when God was saying it is not good for the man to be alone. So I will make a helper, helper suitable for him. The whole idea uh, that it's not good for aloneness to take place in our lives. This isn't talking about marriage or anything. This is talking about the, the fact that, that people need someone to help them as we move through this life together. That, that's, uh, that, that's what this is talking about. And, and now what, what Jethro is telling Moses is you need to not do this alone. And basically what he starts to tell him is, is you need to invest in the lives of others. So what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you, you're going to only wear yourself out. The work is too heavy for you, and you cannot handle it alone. You cannot handle it alone. Hey, could I have my six volunteers come up right now? Perfect. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. So uh, two of these people have agreed to be blindfolded during this. Who are the two? Have a seat. And was it Gail? All right, have a seat. Uh, would you put on your blind? Well, before you put it on, um, just to let you know. So they each have a blindfold. And, and what you are going to be doing, just so you guys, just so you all can see it, is you are going to be taking these red, white, and blue M&Ms, and in just a moment, you're going to separate them into red, white, and blue, okay? But you're going to be blindfolded while this happens. Now, for you all out there, they're going to try and do a close-up on this just to make it a little easier for some of you to see. Now, the two people that you have beside you, they are going to give you instructions of how to do this. They can't touch you. They can't touch the table. They can't touch the, the snack or anything. And they are just going to try to help you to do that. And the first team that wins uh, each gets a, a packet of, of these M&Ms. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So... Um, so just so you know what's going on, I'm, I'm flipping out the, the M&Ms. These were barely only touched by my hands. All right, so if you want to reach out so you make sure you know where the M&Ms are. Okay, now the people who are around them, they're going to try and help them uh, to see who can do it the fastest. One of the funny things that I heard in all of this, if I may say it, is Mark here is colorblind. All right, so that should really help their team a whole lot. All right, so we will see how this goes. On your mark, get set, go. Okay, put one okay, over on the side. Yeah. Okay, now put one kind of in the middle. Okay, so that's white. Oh, and one on the other side. All right. Okay, put your middle one a little bit further over middle. We have microphones that were covered. I'm uncovering them. Take your one that you put on that side and move it over here. So put it, yeah, that's right. So white's on, white's on left. So white's over that's here. Fine. Put Blue's it with in the, the middle. That's fine. Yeah, so All right, this yeah, has already taken a while. Can perfect. somebody start a two-minute timer no. for me? Pick another one. Anybody. Okay, that's that on. Two-minute timer. Over here. Yep. Right. I think, I, think I saw a finger back there. I hope it was Blue, not the middle, the middle one. Yep. That's different. Set it aside. That's good. Okay. Uh, okay. Left index. Red on the other side. That's separate. There you go. All right. Perfect. Okay, now. Okay, red. red. That's with blue. the second one. Middle. Nope, nope, nope. Middle. Nope. 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 That's nope. with the right. blue one. Uh, yeah. Over that. Yep, yeah, there you right go. There. Right there. Okay. Uh, She's white over here. Blue, so let's rock this. Okay. okay. All right. So <laughs> red. Yep. yep. Blue, blue, middle. Red. 
Okay. White. That's okay. Black. You got red. red. That's red. Oh, stuck to my thing. Red. What's this red one? Okay. Is that a white one? That's yep. a white. Those are white. Here, white. Are good. White. Clear over. So yes. that goes to your um, left. Red. red. Left. Okay. okay. White. white again. Blue. Middle. Red. White. Blue. Middle. Chelsea, were you keeping time? Okay, white. thank you. Middle. We're going to yep, move white. this. That's right. Okay, so um, there's blue a pile middle. to your middle. right. Um, white. Red. Go ahead. White. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two blues red. in that pile. We'll move them white. in a minute. Um, blue white. middle. Blue middle. Blue. Um, to the red. Um, over. Uh, nope, we nope, got a pile are already here. sorted. Here. Yeah. Um, okay, yep, so we've here. got white. blues mixed in. Nope, white. Okay, we'll fix it. Blue middle. In the middle. Um, those two need yes. to just scoot down a little bit white, into your other white. pile. Yep, right there. Right yep. There. Okay. okay, and there's white. one more. White. That's red. Those two both are awesome. yeah, over to the red. White. Red. How much time is left, Chelsea? White, white, white. Got it. Blue middle. Red. Fifteen seconds left. Blue. It's at the top. Blue. It's at the top. I'm sorry. Okay, red. down. There we go. Right. Now, um, red. red. And your blue pile. Uh, and your blue pile. Yep. There's, yep. A there's a white one on the nope on the very left side. Down one. Yep, yeah. move that over. There we go. That's oh my goodness, this team I think just won. Stop, you can take off your blindfolds. <laughs> wow, you hear the enthusiasm from the crowd, don't you? I mean, that was pretty amazing. You weren't up front trying to do this. So, so quickly, could you step back a little bit? I'm just going to ask these two some questions. So what type of things that they were sharing with you was helpful uh, as you were blindfolded trying to do it? Either of you, which one? Right hand. Left hand, right hand? Yeah. Middle. middle hand? <laughs> Left hand, right hand, middle hand? Yep. All right. What, anything else that they said that was helpful? They were saying colors, so that, and when I knew where my colors were, I could put them there. I was going to say, we were originally weren't doing colors. We didn't think we were supposed to do colors. So then she heard say them that. say red and white and so stuff. They I said, okay, it. well, we're going to do that. Oh. <laughs> so. Did I say they had, they had separated them in colors? I didn't? No, I said they had to. They could separate them in colors, but I didn't clarify whether or not they could use the words. All right, so maybe that's it. So maybe uh, better instructions would have helped. W which is my second question: What was not helpful uh, for this, or, or what were some of the things that the the people behind you said that wasn't helpful? I guess it was all helpful. <laughs> Apparently, it was all helpful. All right, will you give them a round of applause? Uh, the winners, you each get some. M&Ms, the losers, if you want the M&Ms that have been touched, you are more than welcome to have them. All right, oh, and you're all just kind of walking away without them. Oh, what's <laughs> I, I should get you that, I should, I should get you that, uh, one of the bags that you can fill them up in. I mean, everyone's just waiting, it's fine, we'll just quick do this, they pay attention. I was just going to give him checks. Oh, mm. check. and, and I am the least likely to be sweating up here, so that should help a ton, right? You just dropped one on the floor? Well, the worship team's gonna love ya. And, and so, so you get the idea that sometimes when we enter into these situations and we feel like we're kind of blind to what's going on, it, it would be helpful for us to listen to the voices of other people. And sometimes uh, when you're listening to them, they're going to share some stuff that, that, that in real life would probably be incredibly difficult. No, that's the wrong one. No, that's the wrong pile. That should be somewhere else. Sometimes when we have to listen to people some, and, and, and they will tell us that the things that we are doing aren't right or they aren't the best for us, or it's not a godly and honorable way for us to be moving forward. And that's what Jethro does for Moses. The father-in-law steps in and says, what you're doing, it's not helpful for you. You're going to wear yourself out and for the people around you because they're not going to get the answers that they need except only from you. And there's millions. How's that going to work for you, Moses? I, so this church, we average about 160 on a Sunday, just so you know. Uh, and, and, and here I am, the pastor, right? And I'm the only one. And if the expectation was for me to invest individually with each and every one of us who are here, I would fail. I, I mean, you could already answer the question. How many of you hear from me every week? Uh, the answer isn't a whole lot, right? Because I can't do that. And that's not the way the body of Christ was to be set up. 
And that's what Jethro is beginning to show Moses. He's investing in Moses so that the people of God can live a more effective life the way that God is calling them to do it. And so he starts to offer some advice, and he says, listen now to me. He said, I'm going to give you some advice. All right, so he took the time to, to listen to what was going on, right? He praised God. He celebrated for the things that were going on. And, and then he helps him to see that there are some things going on in your life or in your work that aren't necessarily working the best way. And so now I'm going to share with you some advice, which, friends, we are all called to do. I mean, if we look at, at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Scripture tells us that we are supposed to submit ourselves to one another. Uh, it's talking about the, commu- the body of believers. We are to submit ourselves to one another out of re- respect and reverence for Christ. What the idea is of submission here is, is that we are supposed to place ourselves under somebody else so that we can learn from them. And we do that with each other. That's what the call is. In Colossians, it says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. We have this calling in our lives to help people to learn things about living for Jesus. And sometimes that means correction. Sometimes that means admonition. You're you're doing this thing wrong, but... It's, if you hear the, see the rest of the verse, it says, that we, but we do this with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. It's this, this sense of, of not showing people that they are wrong. It's the sense of helping people move towards the life that God has called us to. And that is amazing. That is what brings joy out of us. That's the psalms, the hymns, the songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. That's what we are called to do when we invest in others. And we allow others to invest in us. He says, listen to me, I'm going to give you some advice, and may God be with you. Now, now again, this is important. As, as we are people that, are, that start moving towards this idea of investing in the lives of others, that this is all about God. I, I love what Hudson Taylor said. Hudson Taylor was a missionary, uh, and at one point he goes to the missions field, gets killed, right? And his wife ends up going in later, and, and, the, and the tribe uh, ends up living their lives for Christ, right? But, but Hudson Taylor has this, just this brilliant statement where he said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. What's the saying? If we're doing the things of God, God is going to work in and through those things to move towards the things that he has for his followers and the believers. He says, listen to me, give, I'm going to give you advice. God be with you, right? You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. That is your job. What you're doing, you've got to keep doing Because you're the one that God has chosen to do that. And so teach them. Teach them his decrees, his instructions. As God shows you things, you need to pass that along to others. But don't just teach them. And this is a really key thing for as we invest our lives in others. We don't just teach people. We don't just tell people. But we also show them. Our lives are to model the things that we have learned. So that we can live more for the way God calls us to. And and when we start to talk with other people about it, they see that some in some places in our lives, change has happened. Teach them and show them the ways they are to live and how they are to behave. Because people need to know, especially in this situation. As I say, they don't even have the law yet. So you got to show them too. You got to show them what it looks like. But he says, also, here's what I need you to do. I need you to select capable men. Now, in the word men here, I I don't believe it's talking just to the males, right? I I think uh, for us in our our culture today, this is talking to all people. But he's saying select capable people from all of the people, right? So now we're looking for people that are capable, people that, that should be the ones who are investing in other people. And so what does capable look like? Well, you're looking for people who fear God, which means that they've surrendered their lives to Christ, and they trust and they they believe that God is the Almighty and they're living for him. So they fear God. They're trustworthy, right? You know that these people are going to follow through on the things that they are asked to do, and they hate dishonest gain. They're not going to do shortcuts. They're not going to do sneak arounds. They're not going to skip this or that in order to make things happen. That's the type of people that that we are looking for when we're seeking to to, uh, fill them so that they can invest in others which is what Jethro is calling Moses to do. He says, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Some people are going to be able to share with more people than others. Let me say that again. Some people are able to share with more people than others. And that's difficult. 
And so the challenge that I heard uh, several years back was this phrase, and I hope you remember this, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And in, in, in the book, uh, uh, Keeping Your Head Above Water, which when I hear that, I immediately think of, what do I think of? Keeping Your Head Above Water. Good times. Keeping your head above water. Right? Temporary laid off. Good times. Easy credit rip off. Good times. Scratching the answer. Never mind. <laughs> We'll finish, we'll finish the service, okay? All right, but, but I love what Dave Stone says in this. Now, he's talking to Christian, for Christian leadership, but I think the idea uh, is helpful for us as we begin to put in our minds that we are called to invest, to be invested in, and then invest in others. He said, it's possible to spread yourself so thin uh, that within the church you are mediocre in four or five areas instead of excellent in one or two. And friends, what happens in the church is, is typically there are a couple of handfuls of people that are doing everything. And, and I'm just trying to be real with you. And that means that things don't work as effectively as we're, they're called to. Now, if we take that principle and move it into investing in others, what does that mean? That means you can't have one or two people seeking to invest in everybody because it's not going to work because they are going to be spread too thin to make it happen. And so maybe God is calling me to be somebody who has invested in, or it's time for me to invest in others. You might be saying, I don't think I could do that. I don't think that I'm ready. I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I'm smart enough. I don't think people like me, whatever you want to say, right? But not me. I challenge you during this series to consider each and every week what it would look like if I were to take the things that I am learning about Christ and share it with others. Step one would be to go home and maybe talk with your family or your friends or whomever you came with. If you, if you came with some people, just talk about the things that you learned. Man, that's investing in others. Here's, here's actually what I'd like us to do. Uh, take a look at the screen if you would. Because I understand that investing uh, in others can seem intimidating, right? And most of us feel ill-equipped. Well, my plan is, is to have you take a look uh, you just at the scale, 1 to 10, and just, and just be honest where you are at. If you are a 1, I'm not ready to mentor at all. Don't even look at me. We shouldn't be making eye contact. Why are you, you know, you could be down there. Or you could be a 10. Yes, I understand that God has called me, and God has given me experiences, and I am ready to share uh, with another person just to help them to move along the path. Honestly, uh, circle or put an X on the number where you think you are at in your head right now. Do you have that number? Uh, my number is an eight, just so you know. You would think I'm a 10, but I struggle with this idea of inadequacy. I, I would probably be a six if I didn't know that God's word was telling me to do this, right? So then I seek to do it. What's your number? And maybe that's the thing you share with your spouse or your family or your friends as you head home today. Just to begin to have the conversation of what it looks like to invest in others. And friends, my hope is at the end of this week six, I'll pull up this graph again. And you will be somewhere closer to being a person who understands that God has called me to invest in others. Lord God, thank you for this challenge. Not easy to hear, but God, as, as you've called us to be disciples who are making disciples, may we be people that are moving towards doing it. God, that we are trusting you to teach us and to guide us. And give us, God, the words to speak to others. Lord, and I ask, God, that you would help each person listening to this right now to start thinking about who's their one. Who is their one? God, I trust that you are speaking to all of us. We are yours. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 10.30 and our doors are open to everyone. 
For more information, please check out our website at thebittenchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.